On this episode of AvTalk, Air India and Qantas make history, and Singapore Airlines takes home the first 787-10. Plus, Ken Hoke is back to fill us in on RVSM airspace. Hello and welcome to episode 28 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik here as always with... Jason Rabinowitz, hello. It's a good thing we write down the episode number because I have totally lost count. Uh, well, I mean, once we got past three or four, I, I just, I completely lost track. So yeah, I, I just keep, I keep a, a Sharpie on my arm. Oh, that's good. Just another that's, line. Uh, like, yeah, tick marks. Perfect. Uh, but it, you know, it's a good thing I can count that high, I guess, at this point. So it's been a busy two weeks, huh? Yeah, I'm tired, yeah. but it's been... <laughs> been an interesting couple of weeks stuff happened which is been stuff unusual did yeah. yeah it's uh i i would say the the busiest kind of you know period that we've had since the beginning of the year i, I think and it's only going to get busier uh, busy is you're, good. well you're you're off to all sorts of far fung places in the next couple of weeks aren't you yeah just uh just one out to hamburg germany for the aircraft interior show that's next no that's the week after next week. So that should be fun. I'm taking a weird combination of Virgin Atlantic connecting to short haul British Airways and British Airways canceled my connecting flight like two months ahead of time. So that was nice of them. Well, th- that was nice is an interesting word. It's I, better I than guess. the day of, but yeah, well, that's uh, true. still weird and annoying. So wh- what did you, what do you... They rebooked me to a later flight, which now leaves me with a five and a half hour layover at Heathrow, which is going to be unpleasant. So it's long enough to begin to hate yourself, but not long enough to do anything. Right. Especially without lounge access or anything coming off a, a red-eyed transatlantic flight. I'll just kind of be swimming around Heathrow delusional. Well, I mean, it, which is probably the second best way to swim through Heathrow. Yeah, delusional, so you don't really know what's happening. This exactly. way to go. You're all set. So, hey, let's use that as our transition. Speaking of Heathrow, Qantas decided to spend 17 hours in the air and fly direct from Perth. Nonstop. Non. Oh, yes. Ooh. Saw this mistake far too many times this week. Yeah. Well, it. I didn't make a mistake. I mean, it's technically true, but it's, it's also true. wrong. Let me finish the sentence. They've been flying non uh, direct, direct for, for I years. Know, I know, decades. I know. Start <sighs> that one over. You're not cutting this out, by the way. But we're leaving this in. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so now that we've you know said nothing, let's unpack our nothingness. Qantas has been flying from Australia to the UK since 1947. The first time they did it, it took. What uh, seven, six stops in between the two city pairs, and something like four days. Fast forward to before last week, and it took you a stop either in Singapore or Dubai to get between the the east coast of Australia and and London. Now it's all Qantas on the seven eight seven dash nine. You can start in Melbourne, go to Perth, and then seventeen hours direct from. 17 hours nonstop. There we go. From Perth to London. And it's the first nonstop flight from Australia to London in the history of forever. Commercial. Right. There is there that was a, one seven four. There was a delivery 747 that did it in 19 hours, but that was from London, if I'm not mistaken. Or something. But this flight, Perth to London, is great circle mapper tells me it is 9,010 miles. And for anyone listening outside the United States, also known as the rest of the world, 14,500 kilometers. And for those keeping track at home, 11,765,704,863 ancient Egyptian royal cubits. Oh, thank you, Google. I actually had to do the math on that one myself. You so that, that wasted was our time. Thank you. So let's get back to the flight itself, which is about – its block time is 17 hours and 20 minutes. It took just about 17 hours. It too. took just about 17 hours. And uh, on the way back, it was about 16. So you you gain an hour going back, kind of. Sort of. Well, that, I mean, seventeen hours is is a a, a long a long time to to spend in an airplane. 
But we've talked about this before. I mean, you know, th- this the thing about this is that it's not the longest flight in the world. It's the the second longest flight by uh, I think twenty two miles, and and I'll let you do the the kilometer conversion on that one between Qatar's uh, Doha Auckland flight. So it's the second longest flight in the world. But but what makes it really interesting is the the first nonstop flight between between Australia and and the UK, which right. is. Pretty, so, pretty, every, pretty amazing. Everyone's kind of been freaking out over this flight, but it's not even close to some of the longest or, or I guess, duration-wise or distance-wise flight. Oh, the old, no, not at all. The old Singapore flight from Newark to Singapore was 9,500 miles and like an the, hour uh, or two longer. Yeah, the, the, the soon – well, I shouldn't say soon, but eventually to be reintroduced. Right. Exactly. This was on the old A340-500 that they flew, which at yeah. the, the later years was business class only. The Qantas has business class, premium economy, and regular economy. So, uh, there are far more people on this aircraft, but I I wouldn't want to do that. I 333 seating on a 787 for, let's face it, up to 19 hours with time spent before and after you actually take off, is, is that sounds just unpleasant. Yeah, I there was a lot of discussion I think this week about whether or not the direct flight and I'm and I'm using this through in the Dubai correct term, or Singapore. Yeah, through Dubai or Singapore. So okay, let's stop for a second and talk about direct versus nonstop because I spent all last week purposefully writing nonstop because direct is technically incorrect. Nonstop means you fly from point A to point B. And that's it. And you don't stop nonstop. In common usage, direct means you go directly to something. In common usage, in airline usage, because nothing is ever that simple, the term direct originates from the land before time when you were flying aircraft that had to stop and refuel, stop and refuel, stop and refuel to get from Chicago to New York. So you would buy a ticket from Chicago to New York and it would be a direct flight to New York but you would stop in South Bend, Indiana, somewhere in Ohio, somewhere in Pennsylvania, probably twice in Pennsylvania, and then eventually end up in New York. But direct it was a basic, single – I mean direct basically now means you make stops but you don't change planes. Right, right. And, and But that's that's where the term comes from. And now – yeah, exactly. Now direct means if I'm flying from Sydney to London on Qantas or on, on Emirates, I'm going to fly from – Qantas changed there, so now it's back to Singapore. So Singapore, fly from Sydney to Singapore, Singapore to to London, and and I get to stay on the plane. Or in some cities, you have to get off the plane, and then you know get right back on. Right, and I can see the arguments on both sides. People wanting to to get it all done with in, in one flight, not have to get off and go through security and do all that nonsense. It also adds complexity, time on the ground, stuff can always go wrong with refueling or catering or weather. So flying nonstop does have its benefits, but that is a long time on that plane. And they charge a premium for it. They're they're not under the illusion that this is just better for, for nothing. People flying this flight on the nonstop to London, they are paying quite a bit more to do so. I guess it remains to be seen how, how lucrative in the long run it will be. But it, it's really interesting to see how – how airlines are continuing to employ the 787. Just today, United oddly announced that Air New Zealand was going to fly nonstop from Auckland to Chicago of all places, which is almost as long a flight. I'm already booked on nine of the first 10 round trips. That doesn't uh, so, sound true. No, that doesn't sound true. But uh, but I am excited about it. I mean, it, it'll be nice to, to A, see a new airline, but B, have that uh, have that next connection. Yeah, definitely odd though. I really don't want to be the guy that flies from Auckland to Chicago nonstop connecting to like, I don't even know where, New York and have a a three hour air traffic (laughs) control delay or something crazy. Oh yeah, no, that would be terrible. But no, it makes sense because it's, you know, Chicago, oh, here's a United hub. So that's New Zealand's expansion has basically been pick a United hub and and then fly there. It's a good plan. Yeah, no, I mean, it's great for, you know, Starlines connecting traffic and I'm just excited because hopefully we'll get to see the All Blacks Dash 9. So that'll be nice. Yeah, that'll be good. It's a good looking plane. What's next? So another first, and this was a, a very interesting – anytime something happens in aviation, you always have to couch it. There, there are so many caveats to the claim that something is the first. 
So this was Air India conducted the first commercial flight bound for Israel that flew through Saudi Arabian airspace. So I, I think those were all of the qualifiers. I think so. But but this is a the first a, that didn't get shot down. Let's go with that. Don't think that's happened. They would try. In well, the okay. past, they, no, they would try. That, that's fair. That's fair. I guess. Fair enough. Back to the, the positive elements of this story, which is kind of what I was going for. It, an important development because it saves two hours, basically between the, the time it would it would normally take with the old routing. So so LL, which flies not not to, to New Delhi, but to, to Mumbai from, from Tel Aviv, basically flies south and then down the Red Sea and then out around Yemen and and across the, the Arabian Sea over to, to India. And Air India now gets to kind of cut the line and, and make their way up the, the length of Saudi Arabia, which is um, saving them about two hours. And so LL, of course, is upset and is lobbying to to get the same same treatment. So it'll be interesting to see if they yeah. can cut, cut <laughs> two hours that. off of a flight time. So I mean, yeah, we'll, the, I, we'll that, see. That region's chock full of crazy geopolitical, I guess, issues that create weird flights. Like you mentioned, the the LL flights take this weird, secured, circuitous route all the way to get to um, out of the region. Out in Asia, everybody avoids North Korea. So if you're flying from Seoul to Vladivostok, which we mentioned a couple weeks ago, you have to do basically fly in at a, a ninety degree angle, straight north and then straight east, yeah. I guess. And they're definitely not alone in Saudi Arabia. There are a number of places where aircraft have to fly ridiculous patterns to avoid specific countries. Well, I mean, even even the the Air India flight is it, it's saving two hours, but it's it's still not the most efficient routing. The, the if you look at the map, the Great Circle route runs from from New Delhi to Tel Aviv, it runs through Iran and it runs through Pakistan. And so Israel's concerns, at least how it was reported in the media, were that they they don't want that flight, the Air India flight passing over Iran or, or Pakistan in case they have some sort of, you know, emergency landing is necessary. They don't want them them landing there, which is, I mean, given, you know, the, the constraints of the, the geopolitical situation is understandable, but it's just one of those things where it's, you know, they're saving two hours by flying over Saudi Arabia, but it still could be a much shorter flight. Nothing's ever as easy or simple as it should be in this industry. Those it it and never is. angles to everything. That is very true. A, a rather impressive, and this was kind of one of those things: is will it happen? Won't it happen? And and then you know, basically, what was it? A week before the the flight was set to launch, they were like, "Yeah, we got approval. We're going." So I don't Hooray. know how, how it was behind the scenes, but it, it seemed a rather um, abrupt announcement that yes, we're going to have these flights. So so they're they're going three three times a week three times a week Tuesday Thursday Saturday if you're interested in flying from from New Delhi to to Tel Aviv on Air India I'm not but thank you but if you were that's uh, that's another way to get there yeah good to know should we talk about another th- so we I guess we're just going through the seven eight sevens today we've got uh, the seven eight seven dash nine we started with we've done the dash eight and now let's do the dash ten. We did the Dash 8? Yeah, Air India used the Dash oh. 8 to, to okay. get to uh, That's to right. Television. They don't have any Dash 9s. They do not. Good point. So the Dash 10 got delivered today, or yesterday and today. I feel like that delivery has been going on for a week. They, I think we're recording this on the 27th of March, and they've just landed in Singapore. So we have a buddy on board, uh, Jeremy Dwyer Lindgren, who's been on the podcast a couple times. He's on the delivery flight. And since they took off, I went to bed, slept for eight hours, went to work, worked for like nine hours, came home, went to the doctor, went to get dinner, ate it, and now we're sitting here and they just landed. So you've you've had a busy day. I, I've lived like a day and a half of my life and they've just now arrived in Singapore. And it, to be fair though, they did stop in Osaka. Not long though. No, but I'm just saying they did stop. It, it wasn't it was a, a, it wasn't direct a, you know, flight. <laughs> We're going to get an email from somebody who's like, no, 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 you're using direct and nonstop wrong. Uh, good thing I don't read those emails. But that's okay. If you do want to send us an email, podcast at f424.com. The 787 9, it's the long, or dash 10, it's the longest of the 
787 family. And Singapore is getting it first, and they're going to put it basically on, on some regional routes, if I'm not mistaken. It's very regional. It's not going far, which is kind of key to the 787-10. It might be longer, the longest of the family, but it cannot fly the furthest of the three. It actually has a shorter range than the nine, which is probably why it doesn't have so many orders yeah, it'll be interesting to see how how it kind of gets employed, not only by Singapore but uh, by everyone else uh, taking taking deliveries soon. And so now all of the the seven eight sevens have been delivered. The eight, the nine, the ten. Boeing's got what the the Max seven left to deliver, and Airbus has the what the three thirty neo three three thirty neo the three fifty ULR. And then we're we're done for a while. Yeah, we're, well, then we turn our attention to Russia and China, basically. Oh, the E two. I'm sorry, we forgot the E two. Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's that's so there. That, but that's happening. What th- this week? Is it? Yeah, oh, that's going to 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 White Row or yes. however you pronounce it. Operated by them for Finnair. That'll be the, I think. Well, next week in in when it's all said and done, when yeah, the airplane I, finally goes home. I think you posted a picture of the Embraer E2, a front-on picture of it, and the damn thing just looks so fake. The engines are gigantic compared to the fuselage. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's yeah that it doesn't look. You're right, it doesn't look real. It, it looks like they took some sort of regional jet and were like, here's some, you know, here's some GE90s, and you know, put them on. I wonder what it would look like if you actually put GE90s on that. Pretty sure the engines would be scraping on the ground. You, you might not want to do that. <laughs> No, probably not. But but yeah, it it the the I I just think that aircraft looks really good. Yeah, it, it's it's a good looking one. I hope we see it up uh, up in North America, but we don't quite know just yet. JetBlue has been shopping around at both the CS three hundred and E two E E one ninety or E one ninety five E two. I think they had both those aircraft up at their hangar at JFK recently. I guess. Uh, kicking tires and seeing what they look like and what they can do, but no decision made. So not going to see one anytime soon, but we will see Delta CS 100s eventually. We we got that taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Boeing decided not to appeal the ruling that there was no harm caused by the C-Series and, and Delta's free to free to take delivery. We don't know when they'll take delivery yet, but eventually, when eventually. they maybe when they open up that factory in Mobile, who knows? Well, I thought they were going to take the the ones from Montreal first. I don't even think they know. Okay, well, well, we'll see when we see it. What else happened the past couple of weeks? The Max Nine went home with Lion Air, the first one. Which livery did it wear this time? Because the Max Eight was weird. The, no, this, this was this was the the Thai Lion Air standard livery. Okay, because I remember the Max 8 was delivered in Melindo Air livery, but it was going to end up actually be like Batik Air Malaysia or something. Like it had an identity crisis from day one. So this one's actually Lion Air proper. This, one, this one's Thai Lion Air proper, sent home, flying, and as far as I know, no identity crises. Oh, that's good. Well, yeah. Good for them. Yeah, and the the Max Seven to to close out new airplanes and deliveries and all that good fun stuff. The Max Seven had its first flight, which, Yay. as you and I both know, thousands of orders for this airplane. Everyone wants one. Literally dozens of orders. L- literally, yeah, I think there there are there. It's like forty. It's it's not many. I don't know if it's exactly forty, but but it's close. I, I think. I actually, two weeks ago, I ended up in. Or two a week and a half ago, I ended up in Seattle just for fun. The, literally the day after the Max Seven's first flight, and a friend of mine said, "Why don't you change your flight and come out a day early and see the Max Seven first flight?" I'm like, "No, no, no." <laughs> was that worth a change fee? No, it, it no. most certainly was not. But you, but you you also ended up in Vancouver, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, that was fun, Vancouver. Was I'm, I'm well? Technically, I never made it to Vancouver. We made it to Vancouver's airport, which was very, very beautiful. Lots of stuff going on there. We had a nice rap tour from the communications people. Um, unfortunately, we were there at a weird time of day, and there wasn't much in the way of aircraft on the ground. But the airport itself is uh, makes me sad when I come back to our airports in New York. 
And and we will put this in the show notes, but you took home a present. Oh, yeah. They gave me a custom designed or I guess custom sourced Lego kit to build the airport. So there isn't an actual Lego sold YVR airport kit, but they took all the pieces necessary and threw it in a Ziploc bag basically. <laughs> and I I spent many hours of attention that I attention span and focus I did not know I had to build it. I don't know where it is now. Oh there it is. It's sitting on the bottom shelf and it was pretty cool. But I man, it's tough to put those things together. <laughs> that that'll be that'll be our offshoot podcast is uh, yeah. Av Geek Lego building. A week and a half later, all the pictures I took are still sitting on my DSLR. I'll, I'll it, get to those eventually. It'll be one episode long. Yeah, Lego Lego is difficult. I can't imagine you having to build those with kids. That sounds horrible. Having a, a toddler who is trying to quote unquote help is is always a, a fun and exciting time. But I dropped a few pieces. They ended up under my couch, and then I realized, oh, there's nine months of dirt under there. I should clean it. So there was some good that came out of it. But did you make your bed? Nope. All right, then. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk about the largest airplane that's getting ready to fly, and we'll talk about how a very large airplane thought it was a very small airplane. And we are back, and we are ready to talk about the Antonov AN-225. Are you excited? I'm excited. Very. I, I would just like the damn thing to come out this way once in a lifetime. <laughs> I, we, I'm telling you, we got to you know rent some mining equipment or something. So we, we talk about this every time it flies because it flies so irregularly. The AN-225, the Antonov AN-225, is the largest cargo aircraft on the on the planet and it will can carry the most it might not be the largest anymore with whatever is it what paul is that allen weird facebook the, thing or well paul not allen the facebook or... probably the straddle launch thing so yeah, I, whatever I think that, that thing might be thing's got like 18 bigger engines. at this point but it, anyway it the, the one that's actually flying super heavy lift stuff amazing to to follow and and listen to and and just watch it get off the ground it has adsb now How'd that happen? I think what happened is they took an ADS-B receiver, or not receiver, transponder, and they installed it in the aircraft. That's exactly I'm, what they needed I'm, to do. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that's what happened, but that's what happened. So it, it's great. Now it uh, they turned it on last week and took it out for a test flight, and they did a low pass with the AN-225. Low pass over what? The, the airport in, in Kiev. And so they filmed it, and we will put that in the show notes. And I highly suggest you enjoy the stirring music that, that accompanies the video. But more importantly, they turn the music down right before the low pass. So you actually Excellent. get to hear the airplane. So they, they did it right. But be forewarned about the, the stirring music accompanying the the particular we video really do need to put a uh, like a GoFundMe thing together to just to pay to get that thing out here once. I mean, it would probably cost us a fair bit of money, but we'll do some research to find out how how fair, and then we'll see how many you know GoFundMe's we need to do. But we'll, we'll get them. there. All, All of them, them, I think. Yeah. So so this time it's it's not coming anywhere near North America. It's staying in Europe in the Middle East. They're still working out the. We had a schedule up. We took the schedule down because we were informed that the schedule is changing completely. And so when the schedule is finalized, we'll put that back up on our website and on the blog, and people can uh, follow follow the AN two two five around. It's supposed to fly basically all of April. So that that'll be exciting to to see it, you know, do more than one flight. So we'll we'll see where we we'll see where we get there. So speaking of transponders, you saw something this week on the internet. I was made aware of it by a number of people. And do you want to explain this one? Sure. Okay. Right. Whatever. So people were browsing the site or whatever it is they do, and they always have a propensity to find weird and odd stuff and what was this say an american a330s transponder was sending out the wrong hex code i believe so basically it's 
identification code that tells the world what it is uh, was wrong. It had a digit off or, or something along those lines. And instead of appearing as an A330-200, it was appearing as a, as a what? A Piper? Piper PA-28. So it appeared on the site as if American was operating a Piper from Frankfurt to Philly or weird transatlantic flights. Yeah, it was a couple different transatlantic flights. Very clearly not what was happening. (laughs) No. So to put that into kind of the, the technical aspect of it, each aircraft transponder has a unique mode s address sometimes it's called the the ico 24 bit address because it's uh 24 bits long and that is used to identify the the particular transponder uh which then gets you know married to an actual aircraft and so that's how we track all of the flights we track every single flight on the site with a, a hex code so if we don't have the hex code uh, we, we don't know what it is or if there's the wrong hex code it'll be displayed incorrectly on the site in this case. So all it took this time was a, a single bit to flip from a from a one to a zero. And and that changed it from an A330 to a to a Piper. I wonder why that happened. It could have been, you know, something they, you know, had to reset an electrical bus or they turned off the plane and turned it back on and, you know, the the one decided it was a zero. And this did not impact what air traffic control saw. So the, there wasn't someone in, in uh, a transoceanic control center seeing a Piper flying an American flight. They they saw the correct information the whole way. You well, I mean, they're, they're seeing, you know, they're, they're seeing the, the assigned squawk and they're seeing the, the call sign and that's that's what they're caring about. And they're also in contact with the aircraft, you know, through radio so that it doesn't really affect anything. But it's sure fun to watch. I do love seeing through no error, data error, but when uh, an aircraft has a, a reused reg when the picture comes up oh, that yeah. is like 30, 40, 50 years old. So you look at a, a brand new A321 and the latest picture for that specific registration is like a, a Caravelle or something crazy like that. Yeah, th- this happened, I think, actually, Singapore... Airlines is a great example of this because they've reused for their A380s and for their their 787s, they've reused old 747 registrations. So for some of them, for their, their second uh, 787-10 9VSCB, the latest photo that we have available is a picture of the, the 747 disused in Victorville. So it's you know covered up the the radom's gone the the weather antenna is just kind of dangling there. It's oh, so, that's right, you sent that to me. Yeah, so it's um it, it's something that we'd like to address. You know, it, it's a database issue as far as how the photos are displayed. We display right now the latest photo available for a particular registration. So working on introducing a bit more logic there. To understand that you know maybe that's not the the right photo to show. I say leave it. <laughs> well, it it's fun sometimes. There there was one that was a I think American took delivery of a new A three twenty one at one point, and there was the the registration that they reused was just it was just a picture of a, a cut up cockpit, like you know <laughs> how like they they cut them off and use them as simulators. Yeah, and it was just a picture of the like the the cockpit that had been cut off. So that's why you might see that on the site. Yeah. So that's that's always good. And and we like when people point those out cuz I mean, you know, a lot of times they're they're very amusing. Sometimes they're not not so much funny, but it is a little bit confusing cuz they'll be very close. So like for the for the Airbus, Airbus reuses regi- test registrations all the time. So it, it like a Emirates A380 could be flying on the same registration that a Singapore a380 flew on and so we'll have a picture of one or the other and it that'll be a bit confusing sometimes but but unfortunately there's there's not really much we can do about that because of the how quickly they reuse the test registrations right but nothing nothing as exciting as turning an a330 into a piper magic a good magic trick for my next trick you can only do it once though there's no going back (laughs) yeah exactly let us stop here and turn things over again to Captain Ken Hoke, 
who is back with another glossary term. This time, he's going to teach us about RVSM airspace. What's that stand for? Well, how about I let Ken tell you? Oh, fair enough. We'll be right back. When airplanes are flying in close proximity, they have to be at different altitudes so they don't bump into one another. This is called vertical separation. The current rules for vertical separation were established back in the 1950s. From the surface to 29,000 feet, or flight level 290, minimum vertical separation is 1,000 feet. Aircraft altimeter accuracy decreases at higher altitudes. So above flight level 290, minimum vertical separation increases to 2,000 feet. More separation to compensate for the altimeter accuracy. Since the 1950s, airspace has become a lot more crowded. Regulators needed a way to squeeze more airplanes into the same airspace. An obvious fix was to reduce vertical separation above flight level 290 from 2,000 to 1,000 feet, so twice as many airplanes could fit in the same airspace. The 2,000-foot minimum separation was because of altimeter accuracy problems. For this to work, regulators had to make sure that 1,000-foot separation above flight level 290 was safe. The solution is called Reduced Vertical Separation Minima, or RVSM. Implementation began in 1997. RVSM airspace generally begins at flight level 290 and extends up to flight level 410. Aircraft need special equipment to fly in this airspace. Most airliners now have the equipment. To fly in RVSM airspace, an aircraft needs two independent altitude measurement systems. These aren't the old 1950s altimeters. They're high-tech and super accurate, and they have to be certified for RVSM operation. The aircraft also needs an altitude alerting system. That lets the crew know if the aircraft leaves its assigned altitude. It provides an audible beep or chirp sound. Next, we need an automatic altitude control system, an autopilot. There's no manual flying in RVSM airspace. Finally, the aircraft needs a transponder that reports altitude to air traffic control. Controllers receive warnings if an aircraft strays more than 200 feet from its assigned altitude. Pilots have special procedures for operating in RVSM airspace. Before each flight, the two primary altimeters must indicate airport elevation within 75 feet. Once in flight, the altimeters are cross-checked every hour. They have to be within 200 feet of each other. If the altimeters disagree more than 200 feet, or if any of the other equipment stops working, we have to tell air traffic control that we are unable RVSM. The controller will either have us descend below our VSM airspace, or the controller can leave us at our altitude if they can make sure we have 2,000 feet separation from nearby aircraft. It's up to the controller. RVSM airspace has now been implemented worldwide. Not only does it increase airspace capacity, it also gives pilots and dispatchers more altitude options so aircraft can be flown more efficiently, which saves fuel, time, and money. It's a pretty good deal. And so now we know what RVSM airspace is. I always knew it was a thing. I didn't know what the name was. So learn something new every day. Well, and, and if you get nothing else from this podcast, it's hopefully something new or I don't know, perhaps. Right. This uh, definitely comes up every now and then someone will send me an email or a, a tweet on Twitter and say, wow, these planes were really close. They were only a thousand feet apart. I'm going to go, yeah, that's uh, what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, and and I think that's uh, we get that as as well a lot. People, you know, it was it was so close. I saw it so close, and you know, that's that they're supposed to be there. This this is the the safe operation and exactly how it's supposed to go, and it it'll keep going like this because they've they figured it out how to do it. Right. But uh, <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah, 
I like that Ken kind of got into the how and the why and that it, it he, he's just really good at this. It's like he's been uh, doing it for for many many years. Who knew? Who the man's knew? got experience. So we we need your help though, dear listeners, to find out what we're going to ask Ken to talk about next. So if you have any questions about what you hear or or see or experience while you're traveling, or you want to know something more about aviation in general, or have a very, very specific question, let us know, podcast at fr24.com. And a few of you have sent us some emails. We had one about a sawing sound, and perhaps a Uh, Some might describe it as a barking dog. Many of you probably know what we're talking about, but we'll get to that one in a future episode because that's definitely a fun one. For now, I think we should should leave it here. Yep. 28 episodes. How do you feel? Ready for, for number 29. All right. In our next episode, we'll have more from Ken, hopefully, and we'll also have more from Jason wherever he may be. Oh, yeah. I'll be in Hamburg when we're supposed to record next. Oops. (laughs) Definitely not packing this damn microphone either. (laughs) We'll figure something out. I am Ian Pechnik. And as always, or maybe not next time. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Here with Jason Rabinowitz. And thank you for listening. And we'll we'll promise we'll figure something out for next time. (laughs) All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.